trickling in, so we'll let them. Yep, we'll let a couple more folks trickle in as we get started here. Um, but my name is Leslie Holland. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist at UW Madison uh, in the area of fruit crop pathology. Uh, and welcome to our beginning grower apple webinar series. Today, our topic is going to be focused on choosing rootstocks and ordering trees with Dr. Amaya Atucha. And for folks, we always get the question if we can watch the recording later, you certainly can. And that's going to be in the chat for you right now to watch the recording in the future of this and our previous webinars. Uh, so Dr. Tuchar, speaker today, is an associate professor in the Gottschalk Endowed Chair for Cranberry Research in the Department of Horticulture at UW-Madison. Her research program focuses on crop, ecophysiology, and production of small fruit and cold climate viticulture. And the goal of her extension program is to generate and provide research-based information that improves crop production and profitability uh, in the Midwest fruit industries. So as Amaya begins to share her screen, um, I just want to remind attendees that uh, we would like you to remain muted throughout the presentation, as well as also keeping your videos off so we can kind of conserve that bandwidth um, and have a nice uh, presentation for everyone to see, especially on the recording. And then as we move to the end, uh, we'll go ahead and have you put your questions in our um, uh, your, our chat box. Uh, and we'll answer those at the end of the discussion, but those can start to accumulate there as you have them. And we'll also have a survey for you at the end of the presentation. And we want to thank this uh, particular webinar series is a collaboration between University of Wisconsin, uh, University of Minnesota, um, University of Illinois, as well as Iowa State University. So we've got some new collaborators this year, and we're really excited to have such a uh, large group of folks contributing to our fruit webinars this season. Uh, so with that, I think I will turn it over to our speaker and I will go ahead and post that link in the chat for everyone again, where you can watch recorded webinars for the entire series. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Leslie. I'm going to start sharing my screen and hopefully if you give me the th thumbs up that you can see this properly. Great. OK, so we'll get started. All right. Um, so. Today we have our second uh, webinar on this series of beginning apple grower. So if you're not a beginner apple grower, maybe a lot of the things that we're going to be talking today are a little bit very basic. Uh, but if you are, are a beginning apple grower or are thinking about expanding your um, orchard, maybe you have you know an older orchard that you bought and you're thinking about renewing that orchard, uh, a lot of the um, information that we'll be sharing today is going to be about how to make those right choices about rootstocks and actually the importance of rootstocks when it comes to apple production. So let me go through uh, the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Well, this is my... There we go. So we're going to talk briefly about apple tree propagation because you know, we can't talk about rootstock without understanding uh, apple tree propagation. I will be uh, talking about the different types of rootstocks that we have. I will also talk a little bit about the available commercially, commercially available rootstocks for apples. I will give some, you know, uh, guidance about selecting the rootstocks. And then I will be also talking about ordering plants and timeline for ordering plants. What I will not be covering in this webinar is a specific rootstock traits. I will not be talking about, there's so many different rootstocks. I'm not going to be describing each one individually. There's so much information online from extension sites about this that I don't think is relevant for me to uh, spend this time talking about that. And I'm also not going to be giving a specific scion rootstock combination. And then you'll understand why I'm not going to be doing this because this is very you know, specific to your site, your conditions, and also your goals uh, with your orchard. So I'm not going to be talking about that. So let's get started and let's talk a little bit about um, how are apple trees propagated. So what I said before is like we can't talk about rootstocks if we don't first talk about apple propagation. And so the first thing that, you know, when we when we talk about apple propagation is that apple trees are vegetatively propagating mostly through grafting. Um, and, and why is this? It's because if you were to plant a seed of an apple, let's say you know, you're eating a, a red delicious or a honey crisp, and you take one of those seeds 
and you planted them, you're growing into a tree, well, the tree that is going to grow will not have the same traits and characteristics as the parents. And why is this? It's because there's genetic recombination on that seed. And so this is very similar to kids. Kids resemble their parents, but they're not identical to their parents. Why? Because there's genetic recombination. And so think about a seed as a kid, like the combination of the genetic information from the two plants, uh, from the pollen and the ovule of the plant that uh, produce that fruit. And so the only way for us to propagate these specific cultivars that we've selected is through vegetative propagation or basically cloning them over and over and over again. And so to propagate apple trees, uh, what we actually do is uh, we graft the scion or the cultivar that we want onto a, a rootstock. So you can see there in that picture, um, a plant that is a, an apple tree and that is formed by uh, the rootstock, which is basically um, what is gonna produce the root system. And then you see the graft union, the union of these two different uh, plant materials with the scion that is the cultivar. The same in this case could be, you know, as I said, red delicious or golden delicious or honey crisp. And then that is joined together and forming one single unit that is formed by the rootstock and the scion, and those are gonna be our apple trees. And so uh, if you're not familiar at all with grafting, uh, there's, whoop, if you're not familiar with grafting, there's um, an image there that shows multiple different types of grafting. Uh, there's different types that you can use for apple propag uh, propagation, where is a bud uh, grafting, you can do cleft grafting, there's multiple different types. And you might be wondering how we propagate rootstocks. Well, rootstocks are also vegetatively propagated and they're usually propagated uh, on stool beds. So basically what we do is um, we let the selected plant material grow. You can see that image there that is uh, numerated. And, and then we cut those uh, rootstocks all the way to the ground and we mount them and we let new shoots come out. And when they're mounted, those shoots will root and then we can individually separate them and produce a lot more rootstocks and that's the image that you can see in the bottom from one of the nurseries there that they are propagating vegetatively rootstocks so the scions are grafted and um, the rootstocks are propagating by these uh, stool beds so both of them we are cloning a specific material that we've selected because it has certain traits that we're interested in that if we were to plant the seeds, then we'll, each individual will be different because there is genetic recombination. Okay, so that is just a very brief introduction about how we propagate uh, apple trees. So why do we use rootstocks? The reason why we use rootstocks is, uh, and we don't, you know, you could ask me, why don't we just use the same process that you just described for the root for the for the rootstocks? We use it for the science. Let's see, let's say for example we have honey crisp and we want to multiply vegetatively. We just root this piece of honey crisp and we just put it in in the ground in on its own roots. And the reason why we don't do that and we use these rootstocks is because uh, the rootstock will impact the way our varieties, our science are going to grow. It will impact many things uh, from their fruiting habit to the yield potential. So that's the reason why we're using rootstocks. The rootstocks that form the root uh, system of these trees are going to confer a number of properties that are really critical for a successful, uh, successfully growing apples. One of it, and the most important one, is the size of the trees. So the type of rootstock will affect the size of the tree. It will also affect its precocity. And what this means is the timing that it takes for that tree from when you plant it until you get to their full potential, their full yield potential, the maximum fruit that they can produce. It will also affect the productivity, how much fruit you produce. It will also affect nutrient uptake. Different rootstocks have the capacity to uptake different rates of uh, nutrients, and that obviously will impact their growth and their productivity. This will also affect fruit quality. And the other reason why we use rootstocks is because rootstocks can confer some disease resistance, especially when it comes to diseases that are related to the root system and some potential diseases uh, and 
limitations that we have in the soil itself. So I'm going to go through each one of these and I'm going to talk a little bit about the different rootstocks and what they do and how they can help us address some of the limitations that we might have and why we're using them. So the first one that I was talking about is the effect of the rootstocks on tree size. So when we talked about apple trees, we tend to separate those in different groups depending on the tree size. So we talk about dwarfing, semi-dwarfing, figures, and standards. So you can see the image here going from uh, left to right, from a smaller tree, a dwarf tree, all the way to what we call a seedling. So a seedling, or what we refer to as a standard tree, it would be a tree that is grown on its own root, that is not grafted. That tree is going to be a really big tree. Those trees that you start from a seed can grow all the way until sometimes like 40 feet tall. Uh, and those were the type of trees that we grew, you know, 70 years ago, very big, huge trees um, that, you know, were very difficult, they would take a very long time to grow those trees to get to their maximum size and yield potential, but also trees that will take a very long time to start producing fruit. And so this is one of the main reasons why we don't want to use these trees and we want to use rootstocks that can control the size of the tree. Because if we have a rootstock that allows us to have smaller trees, it means that we can plant those trees at a higher density. And when we plant those trees at a higher density, we can reach the maximum yield potential of that area in a shorter period of time in less number of years. So having a smaller trees has a lot of benefits from mechanization, easily to harvest, to spray, uh, but also has a big implications on productivity. Smaller trees that devote less time in growing their framework, their branches, and devote that energy into growing fruit uh, are going to be much more productive. You know, uh, and so how to achieve this? We achieve this through rootstocks. So in the 80s, the first generation of dwarfing rootstocks were released, and this really allowed for what I was just explaining, this higher density. Those trees, the first generation were about, you know, between 50 to 80 percent the size of a standard tree. So you can see there, you know, from the seedling all the way to the semi-dwarf. The semi-dwarf, when it says 50 to 70 percent of a standard, is 50 to 70 percent the size of a seedling tree, so considerably smaller. So with this type of smaller semi-dwarfing trees, it would take maybe about you know, eight years until those trees would achieve their full crop, a full potential crop, while a seedling would take sometimes you know, 10 to 12 years. That's a very long time to wait and invest on an orchard to be able to get the maximum yield potential. In the last 20 years, we really have moved a lot into these more dwarfing, smaller rootstocks. Uh, and these rootstocks are able, the newer ones are much more dwarfing, they are able to come to their full production by the third or fourth year after you plant them. However, one big difference between these dwarfing rootstocks and the more vigorous standard rootstocks is that dwarfing rootstock, even though they start producing earlier and are more efficient in, in, in terms of producing fruit, they're also weaker trees because they're smaller. And in this case, the majority of these orchards in high density do require additional um, structure, support structures. And so we tend to grow these high density orchards that use dwarfing rootstocks on uh, orchards that will have a trellis system in which the, trellis, the trees can be supported. If not, those trees would break. They're not able to withstand the weight of all that fruit in this very small frame. Okay, so these dwarfing rootstocks that may be 20 to 40 percent the size of a uh, standard a seedling, they do require um, some support system. They will require trellis. So here is another image showing you the different types of rootstocks that we have from the different sizes, from you know a seedling, a very big tree to some very, very small dwarfing trees. Like here, one example is this MM27 or the Geneva 65. These are just different types of rootstocks that are available. And you can see that all of them, they're, they're, there's a big um, variety in terms of sizes within the rootstocks that we have available. And this is, this is part of the reasons why 
it's sometimes really hard to choose a specific rootstock. But as I go through the presentation, I will give you some more, more uh, advice and tips about how to think about this. But if you want to grow a high density apple orchard, you need to understand that you will not be able to grow them on these really big rootstocks, the seedling rootstocks. You will have to go into a dwarfing rootstock. The other effect that um, rootstocks can have on apple production, as I say, is the precocity and the productivity. So smaller trees will be more precocious. They will start producing flowers early on, and they will start producing fruit sometimes by the second year after you plant them. And they can achieve a full crop by the fourth year compared to bigger trees. A smaller trees uh, at higher densities will reach the maximum productivity of that specific unit of time earlier than trees that are bigger and they're planted at a lower density. And these have huge impacts on the economics of growing apples. If you're investing a lot of money into this orchard, you want this orchard to start producing their maximum yield potential as fast as possible so that you can recover this investment. And the only way of doing this is by using dwarfing rootstocks. So I have here an example of productivity and precocity of rootstocks, how they change. And what I want you to focus on here is uh, you have uh, on the left column, what is the bigger category. So it separates it from on the very top, the biggest trees, the less dwarfing trees, all the way to the bottom of, of this uh, table that shows the smallest trees. And that can be represented by what we call the trunk cross-sectional area. This is basically measures the area of the trunk. How big the trunk is, is a representation of how big those trees are going to be. So you can see in a semi-standard rootstock, you have a much bigger tree than if you have a sub-dwarf or a small dwarf tree that is much smaller. The other thing that I want you to look at is this uh, left right column that shows the cumulative yield or um, deficiency. This basically is a relationship between the size of the tree and how much fruit it produces. So the higher the number means that the tree is smaller and produce a lot more fruit. The smaller the number means less fruit production and bigger tree, more of that energy devoted into growing shoots, leaves, branches. And if you look at the semi-standard or the large semi-dwarf rootstock, those rootstocks are really big, you can see that cumulative over four years, those trees are way less efficient in producing fruit. They spend a lot more energy into producing wood. Well, if you compare them with you know, a moderate dwarf rootstock, you can see that those numbers in cumulative yield efficiency are much higher, meaning those smaller trees are much more efficient in producing fruit uh, compared with all the trees. So that, again, is how this size of the rootstock is going to affect your productivity and how early you're going to start producing fruit. The next thing that I want to talk about is that rootstocks also can have an effect on nutrient uptake, and this will affect the quality of your fruit. So in this table that I show here that I took from, you know, one of the many studies that we have many, many, many publications about evaluating different rootstocks. This is a study in which they were um, evaluating very small rootstocks like M9 that you could see there with very big rootstocks like the seedlings that you can see. And in two different varieties, there's Gala and there's Golden. And what I want you to focus on is on the different nutrient levels that they found on those uh, trees. So you can see that there's a variation in the amount of nitrogen on those trees, depending on, on what rootstock you're growing them. And you can see that smaller rootstocks that will, re will result in uh, trees that are smaller size, like M9, tend to have a little bit higher content of certain nutrients. In this case, I'm highlighting nitrogen, compared with uh, a gala variety growing on a seedling rootstock. The seedling rootstock, remember again, is this huge, really big rootstock that is going to produce that gigantic tree. And so this difference in the level of uptake of fruit, of, of different nutrients, will affect the quality of your fruit. 
And I specifically put an image there on the right of a disorder that's called bitter pit. And this bitter pit is a, a problem that affects mostly honeycrisp variety, but it also affects other varieties. And you can see that you see those brown dots all over, sunken brown, dark dots all over the fruit. And that is usually related with uh, nutrient imbalances uh, between calcium and nitrogen and potassium. So if you have a certain rootstock that tends to take up more nutrients or a specific nutrient in higher quantities than other, that could relate that when you plant your orchard, your, your, your crop, your fruit might have more propensity to have certain disorders. Okay, so that is something, this is actually a, a very, very um, active area of research on apple production right now, because we're seeing a lot of these disorders. And the more we do research, the more we'll figure out a lot of it has to do actually with the type of rootstocks that we're using. And this is certainly true for honeycrisp production. Uh, other effects that uh, rootstocks can have are um, disease and insect pest resistance. And this is actually really uh, relevant. One of them is replant disease. And so replant disease, if you're not familiar with this, is a real concern for fruit production and is certainly a concern for apple production. So replant disease usually occurs when you're establishing the same or related species on an old orchard site. So let's say, for example, you bought an old orchard, you decided that you don't want to grow those apple trees anymore because it's not the cultivar that you're interested in, or it's an old orchard that needs renovation. You remove the old orchard, and on top of it, you go and you plant new apple trees. Okay. What is going to happen is that those young trees that you're planting there are really going to be affected by those apple trees, those old apple trees that were there before. And so what happens is that this replant disease, which is a complex, is basically a buildup of microorganisms in the soil. And a lot of those microorganisms can be pathogens. So when you plant your new little tree in there, all of those roots are affected by these pathogens. They don't grow and the tree is stunt. It never really grows well enough. You never feel the space. Those trees are you know, not really growing at all. And it takes a very long time. And sometimes it will, those trees will never recover and never become a fully grown tree the size that you want. So this is a, an, an image that I'm putting there. Those are two different sites. One is a replant site, which is the image that you see on the left side. You can see that those trees look really sick. They're not vigorous. They're not growing as well as the trees that are on the right side. Those are the same trees, the same rootstock, the same variety planted at the same time. One on a soil that is a replant soil where there used to be an apple orchard before, and another one that is a, 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 a row of trees that were planted on virgin soil also that had never had apples before. So the way that we used to deal with this um, is that growers would fumigate their soil with chemicals to kill every pathogen, every microorganism in the soil. And that obviously has some really uh, big environmental implications. So we don't do those anymore. But what we do have now is new rootstocks that are tolerant to replant disease. So if you're in a situation like this, where you're replanting an orchard, you know, the fact that we have available new rootstocks that you can use in this situation is really important to know because this will, you know, save you all of the hazards that comes and the problems that I have with replanting uh, apple trees um, and, and the lack of growth and productivity. So rootstocks, again, can affect how they develop in this replant size. Rootstocks, uh, we have some rootstocks that are um, resistant to some major diseases as fire blight. And I'm not an expert on fire blight. Leslie is our plant pathologist here and an expert on this disease. But basically, fire blight is a really important disease affecting apples in our region. It's caused by a bacteria and it's really devastating. When the disease affects the scion, the variety, uh, it can be managed in a certain way, mostly with pruning if you, you know, if you manage them early on. But however, if the disease is affecting the rootstock, you can not prune it and the tree will die, the tree will completely collapse. So um, that's why, you know, using fire blight resistant rootstock is really key to be able to manage the disease. And this is certainly a disease that we see a lot here in Wisconsin. It's, it's a big problem. 
Other diseases for which we have resistant rootstocks that you should consider if this is a potential problem on your site are resistance to crown and root rot. This is um, Phytophthora. So if you have a site in which you have a really, really heavy soil, soil that tends to be saturated in the spring with some of those heavy rains or in the fall or with the melting of the snow during the early spring, you know, you, you have a predisposition to have some of these crown and root rods. So thinking about selecting a rootstock that might have this property of resistant or tolerance to some of these diseases is really important. Other things that we have, we also have some rootstocks for apple production that are resistant to some insects. Um, woolly apple aphid is a, is a big problem. It's one of those um, big insect pests problems that we can have, and we do have some rootstocks that are resistant to this particular insect pest. Um, so those are just sort of like a summary of why we're using rootstock, what are the different um, properties that a rootstock can confer to our apple trees and how we can use them to overcome certain limitations that we have Rachel. in our orchards. Well, if people can please mute themselves. I would appreciate that. Thank you. But now I want to talk about what are the different types of rootstocks that we have for apple production available. So as I said before at the beginning of the presentation, I'm not going to talk specifically about each individual rootstock, but I just want you to have sort of like a general idea of the different types of rootstocks that we have and where they're coming from. So the first group that I'm going to talk about is the melon series. And these uh, rootstocks are coming from a research um, program in the East Melling Research Station in the UK, and they're known for their size controlling, their early ripening, and their really high yields. So these are the first series of rootstocks that had a controlling size of those trees, how big those trees were going to be. Um, among the many that they have, and I'm not listing them all of them, but M9 is perhaps the most popular rootstocks in the United States and Europe. However, it does have uh, some limitations. One of them for this particular rootstock is that it's highly susceptible to fire blight. This is a disease that I just explained uh, before. Within the M9, there's also different clones or selections of these specific rootstocks. And so if you go through a catalog of a nursery, you're going to see things like M9, EMLA or M9 Pajam or M9 NIC29. All of those are slight variations of M9. Some of them have more vigor or less vigor from the original one. Uh, we also have some of them that are um, disease free or virus free that they have been screened and treated so that there's no diseases on this type of material. But you can see there uh, the different types of uh, from the Malin series and all of these rootstocks from now on, you're always going to see them listed. The first one is the most dwarfing one to the biggest ones from this M27 in this case is the most dwarfing root rootstock of the series and M2 would be the rootstock that is going to give you the biggest tree. Then the next series is the Maling Merton series. Uh, so the Maling Merton is also coming from the UK from two different breeding programs that generated uh, some, some uh, new selections and they're always defined as MM. So these two MM106 and MM111 are relatively vigorous rootstocks. And you know this MM111 is a standard rootstock um, that was used a lot during the 80s when we tended to have much bigger trees in our orchards in a much lower density. The next group is the Budagovsky series. This is a series that comes from Russia, it was created there, was, uh, and, and the goal of this series was to have rootstocks that had improved cold hardiness. Okay, And so B9 uh, has been one of the replacements for M9 because it tends to be um, much cold hardy. So in areas like, for example, here in the upper Midwest, especially here in Wisconsin, B9 has been one of those rootstocks that have been planted more than M9. It produces about the same size of tree with the difference that B9 is a lot more cold hardy than M9. The next group is the Geneva series. Uh, the Geneva series were developed at the Geneva Research Station in upstate New York, uh, the USDA Research Station. 
And this series is uh, probably nowadays the most popular rootstocks that are being used for apple production. They are um, highly resistant to fire blight, many of them. They are also resistant to woolly aphid. Some of them are resistant to root rot, and a number of them are also resistant or tolerant to replant disease. So they are not only controlling of the size of the tree, there's a whole variety from really dwarfing to more vigorous rootstocks, but they also have a lot of these um, other traits that makes them very popular nowadays in all of the new um, apple production and all of the new orchards. Many of them are going into this, using these Geneva rootstocks. We also have the vine line series and the vine lines was, uh, they were developed at the horticulture experiment station at vine line station in Ontario, Canada. They're known for their increased cold hardiness as well. And they're also uh, fiber resistant, especially compared to, you know, some of those uh, malin series rootstocks that don't have this fire blight resistance. You might also encounter uh, the P series. And so this is coming from the research institute in Poland. And again, in this case, these rootstocks were bred for uh, cold hardiness, but also for resistant to collar rot. And then the last series that I'm gonna be talking about is uh, the supporter series. These have been developed in Germany in the Pilitzner supporter series is called. Um, and among these rootstocks, supporter four is um, something very similar to uh, M26. And these, again, are coming from Germany. So as you see, there's a lot of different series with different traits, which makes choosing rootstocks uh, very overwhelming because there's so many different options. I also want to talk about interstems, and I'm going to explain this a little bit more for those that are not familiar with this. So, because many um, dwarfing rootstocks, these rootstocks that are going to produce really small trees, require support. Some uh, dwarf rootstocks are sometimes used as an interstem to combine the desired characteristics of vigor that uh, an understock can provide with a dwarfing interstem. So what that means basically is that you can use a rootstock, as you can see in this image, that is um, very vigorous compared to you know, something that you know, will, will produce a bigger tree. And then on top of that, you graft an interstem that is a dwarfing rootstock. And then on top of that dwarfing rootstock, you graft your scion, your variety, honeycrisp. Red delicious, golden delicious, whatever it is that you want to grow. So what does that mean? This bigger rootstock that is going to produce the root system is going to have a big root system that is going to enable that tree to almost be freestanding, not require any support. While the interstem of the dwarfing rootstock will confer the smaller size of your sign. So sort of it's 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 a combination of both of them that can give you. Uh, the possibility of growing these uh, smaller trees with less support okay and also it will this interstem that is dwarfing will confer that precocity and that high yield that if you were using some of these more vigorous rootstocks you will not get okay so that is what we use uh, the interstem for because you know it has that property that would allow us to uh, grow them freestanding there's many combinations of this. The most popular ones I listed there uh, on the second row, something like uh, using an, uh, an MN106 and then on top of it, grafting an M9 and then your cultivar or an M9 over an MN111. There's multiple types of different uh, uh, combinations here. One thing that is important to mention is that if you want an inter-stem tree, like this one's here, those ones really require one extra year in the nursery because you have to double graft them. Though there's new technologies there to kind of uh, shorten that period of time, but in general, producing this kind of tree requires a longer period of time than if you're buying a tree that is just grafting onto one single rootstock. So, you know, they're more expensive and they require longer period of times in the nursery. So if you're planning on something like this, you need to think that you need to start 
ordering your trees even earlier than you would order your normal trees. Okay, so let's jump into uh, selecting a rootstock. <clears throat> so if you're planning to have a high density apple orchard, you know, anywhere between 1200 to 2600 trees per acre, you will require a dwarfing rootstock, something that will control the size of your trees. This type of orchard uh, will also need support for those trees, so you will need a trellis system. And so this orchard, the goal of this orchard, because you're investing so much of it, is really to be able to achieve this maximum yield potential within the first three to five years. You want those trees to grow to their height, to complete their height, and to start producing fruit right away. So in this system, the choice of rootstocks really have a huge, huge economic consequences. And the rootstock that you're looking for in a high density orchard is a rootstock that will provide enough vigor to those trees to allocate, to fill up their allocated space, as you can see in the case of the uh, right side picture, those trees have reached the maximum height um, in a short period of time and that they will start producing fruit really early on. So for high density orchards, you need to use a dwarfing rootstock. There's no way around. You can grow this type of system if you're using a very vigorous tree. Okay, so that that is one thing. Once you know what type of orchard you're going to have, and a lot of the new orchards are going into high density because economically, there's they they make so much more sense economically. This is really where you can make money out of these orchards if you have a high density orchard. You will have to use a dwarfing rootstock. So that is one criteria to think about what type of rootstocks you're going to use. The second criteria, which is actually really important, is the vigor of the scion. And we haven't talked about this. One thing is the vigor of the rootstock, but the scion itself, the cultivar that you're growing, also have vigor characteristics. There's some scions that will be more vigorously growing than others. Okay, for example, one scion that has low vigor is honeycrisp. Honeycrisp scion doesn't grow a lot. The honeycrisp portion of the tree is not very vigorous. So if you use a very dwarfing rootstock, a rootstock that is going to produce a very small tree, and on top of it, you put a variety, a cultivar that is very, very low vigor, those trees are going to have a really hard time growing. They're going to be very small trees, and they will never fill up their space. So thinking about the type of rootstock and cyan combination is really important and is something that you have to consider. And I put this image that I got from the UMN website uh, of their trials of evaluating different rootstocks because that's exactly what I wanted to show here. You can see that on the left side of the picture, there are very tall trees, really big trees. And then on the, on the more like right side of it, there are much smaller trees. So when I said about trees not filling up the space, you can see that those smaller trees have a lot of area up there in uh, the top portion of that trellis that there's, 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 no, there's no tree, there's no branches, there's no fruit. You're losing that potential uh, productive space where you could have apples, where you could be harvesting apples. So that's what happens when you are um, choosing a cyan rootstock combination that is not vigorous enough to fill up all that space. So I'll provide you know, some guidelines here on the different vigor that cultivars can have. So we have low vigor cultivars and some of them, you know, Honeycrisp and Pyre, Ida Red, some of the new cultivars like Evercrips. These tend to be uh, science cultivars that will have naturally low vigor. So if you pair them with a rootstock that is also very dwarfing, you're going to end up with very, very small trees and you will have a very hard time filling up your space in your orchard, the allocated space for those trees. There's uh, medium vigor cultivars such as Crimson Crisp and Sweet Tango, Ray, those are all new cultivars, club cultivars, but things like Fuji and Gala and you know Golden Delicious, they're considered medium vigor cultivars. And then we have some that they're high vigor, things like 
Pink Lady, and uh, Jonah Gold, Northern Spy, Spartan. These are really, really bigger science. So if you pair them with a very dwarfing rootstock, this is a good combination because the rootstock will also help alleviate some of the vigor that is coming from the scion itself. So this is a very important thing to think about. What are the cultivars that you wanna grow? What are their vigor? What am I gonna pair with in terms of rootstocks? The next criteria to think about what type of rootstock you want to select for your site is considering the soil type that you have and the cropping history. And this again has to do with the vigor of the tree. The texture of your soil, the percentage of organic matter that the soil has, the soil depth, the available depth that you have for those roots to develop, and also the amount of nutrients that are in your soil are all things that you need to consider before you select a rootstock. And why is that? If you have a soil or an area where you want to establish an orchard that is very fertile, let's say it has a lot of organic matter, a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those trees are going to grow a lot. And if you're not choosing a rootstock that is dwarfing enough, then you might end up with trees much more vigorous than what you wanted that will result in a lot of work for pruning and training and additional work in trying to control the size of those trees so when you have areas that are very so soil that is very vigorous uh, so that is very sorry fertile with a lot of nutrients you need to think about maybe having a more dwarfing rootstock that you would have considered because those trees are naturally going to grow more because there's more nutrients available in that soil so let me give you an example. You know, if you have sandy or gravel soils that don't have a lot of available soil, those soils are the soils that are going to be the poorest soils and those trees are going to struggle to grow. If you put a very, very dwarfing rootstock, those trees are going to have a really hard time growing. So you need a more vigorous rootstock. If you have, you know, something that is low fertility, it's also a sandy loam soil, uh, that soil would have a little bit more nutrient for those trees, so maybe you don't have to go with such a vigorous rootstock. You can start using more of those dwarfing rootstock, and so on and so on. So what I put here is how the soil fertility and the type of soil that you have is going to affect the size of your tree from very low vigor, naturally happen because your soil is very poor, to really high vigor just because you have a very high fertile soil. So this is something very important. This is something that you need to think about years before you start ordering your trees. You need to do soil samples. You need to look at the type of soil that you have. This is really important to choose the right rootstock for your orchard. Another thing that I want to bring again is the replant site. So if you have a site that you are replanting, you really need to consider some of those rootstocks that do have tolerance to replant sites. Uh, if you're renovating, if you're planting a new site that had a history of growing apples before, you need to consider a rootstock that has um, tolerance to replant. Other considerations when you're selecting a rootstock, things that will also play into which rootstock you're going to choose. Your climate. Cold hardiness, especially here in Wisconsin, is really important. We know that there's some rootstocks that are more cold hardy than others. So if you're in a site that is a very cold site, that you know that you can potentially have cold damage, that you know maybe from your neighbors of other um, apple growers around that area that experience cold damage, maybe you want to go and look into some of these uh, rootstocks that have higher cold hardiness uh, traits. Irrigation. This is another one to consider. High density orchards that are using dwarfing rootstocks are going to produce trees that are small. And a small tree above ground also is a small tree below ground. What does it mean? It means that small root trees are gonna have small root systems. If you have small root system, you need to provide irrigation because that tree doesn't have the capacity of exploring a large volume of soil to find that water. So if you are um, considering some of these 
dwarfing rootstock, you need to think about your irrigation. That's another thing. Whether you will be able to provide irrigation or not is going to affect what type of rootstock you're going to choose. So now, after I've talked about all the different things that you need to consider when choosing a specific rootstock, I want to talk a little bit something that is, you know, really, really critical, and it's the timing of ordering your trees. I, you know, I really want to uh, emphasize this point because when you start an orchard with low quality trees, because you did not order them on time and you got whatever was left on the nursery, those trees will never recover. You start from a low quality tree, that tree will never become a high quality, high yielding tree. So, you know, making sure that you are buying the best possible tree that you can is really, really important. And that starts with ordering trees early on. So one thing that I always recommend is if you're going to work with a specific nursery, you know, talk with other growers that might have purchased trees from the nursery. Talk to them about the quality of this tree, what kind of trees you got from them. If you have a chance, visit a nursery, especially if it's a nursery that you don't know or you were not able to find any information, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing is that you need to order your trees two to three years before you are going to plant so that you can actually get the choice of cultivar and roots of combination that you want. If you go right now, to a website, to a nursery, and you try to find some apple trees to buy and to plant in May, you're gonna see, first of all, that the stocks are really, really low, but there are also only certain combinations left. So if you wanna grow a specific cultivar with a specific rootstock of your choice, because you've already done the research of the limitations of your site, and you decided that your best rootstock, let's say, is you know one of the Geneva series, if you call now the nursery, there will be no trees. You need to think about this two to three years in advance. So this is a, is a much longer process of selecting your rootstock than what you might have thought. The other thing is, uh, as I said, the quality of your tree. You don't want to buy a low quality tree or a tree that is in reduced price. This tree long term is going to be a lot more expensive than investing a couple more dollars in a high quality tree with time. That tree will never be as productive as a, starting with a really good tree. Um, there are uh, different types of trees that you can get from, a, from the nurseries. I put an image here of two different types of tree. On the right side, you can see those trees that have what we call feathers. They have all of those lateral um, branches versus the, the picture of the, of the tree on the right side, which is what we call a whip. It's a one-year-old growth. There's no lateral growth. Those two trees are going to behave very differently when you plant them. The tree that already has lateral branches is going to be a tree that is going to develop much faster and is going to reach their maximum potential much faster than a tree that is a smaller diameter tree and that might not have some of these feathers but the tree that is more developed and bigger is going to be more expensive than the tree on the right side. So you need to think about, you wanna buy the best possible tree to start your orchard so that your orchard develops as fast as possible and you, and you reach that maximum yield potential in the shortest amount of time. When you're buying trees, you know, a lot of those trees comes like this, like a whip tree, what you want to look at is the diameter of the tree. In general, you want something that is, you know, a half an inch to, uh, you know, five eighths of an inch is usually what you will find. Uh, these trees are usually some, somewhere between four to six feet tall. Uh, and if you cannot find this kind of tree, the next size of tree, the next smaller size of tree is something between this, like a um, three eighths of an inch to half an inch diameter. Uh, those trees, again, are the kind of uh, trees that you're looking for to establish your orchard. You don't want anything that is smaller than that because it's going to take you a very long time to uh, establish those trees. Also, some nurseries, if you are trying to grow a cultivar, let's say a cultivar that's not very popular, or you're trying to propagate, I get this question a lot. You know, we, I have this variety that I don't know what it is. And uh, it's, a, it's a great apple. I really like them. I would like to uh, produce more of these trees. 
or maybe let's say an antique variety that is not very commonly found on nurseries. Some nurseries will costume graft the cultivar that you want uh, if you provide the cyan wood. They will do that for you, but again, this takes time and planning. So those two to three years before planting are critical to get all of the things that you're looking for. And then the last thing that I'm gonna say about ordering your trees is you wanna make sure that they are virus tested, they're virus free tested. So uh, trees that are, have no disease, they're virus free, it's really important to start your orchard again with the best possible trees that you can. So that was a lot of information and I'm gonna go through um, a summary of some of the things that I said and I wanna leave a lot of time to answer questions. So from the things that I cover in this short webinar, the first thing I wanna say is root suck selection has a significant economical consequences in your orchard. Choosing the wrong rootstock, you know, can cost you a lot of money. So doing proper research is really important with time to select the best rootstock for your site, for the type of growing system that you're interested in. There are many options of rootstock and we're lucky for apple production because this is definitely not the case on a lot of other fruit crops. So in the case of apples, it can be overwhelming because we have so many, because, but also we're thankful that we have all of those different options. Define what is your production system. If you're going to go on high density or uh, medium density, what is it that you're looking for? What is the type of orchard that you want to grow? But also make sure that you know what are the limitations of your site. You have poor soil or you have soil that is very fertile. It's a replant site. Maybe it's not a replant site. Maybe you have soils that are very heavy and that uh, soil holds a lot of water. They take a very long time to drain. Well, in that case, you want to think about a rootstock that maybe is resistant to some of these wood and color rots because you know you're going to have a lot of water on that soil that could potentially um, produce some of this uh, disease problem. Again, matching the cyan vigor to the rootstock vigor is really critical for success. What is the variety that you're interested in growing? What is it that you want to grow? What is the vigor of that? And what type of rootstock works the best with that? It's very important. Um, order the trees at least two to three years in advance so you can get the best quality trees and the cyan roots and combination that you want is very, very, very important. And then there are so many resources online, especially from extension, from the university extension sites that describe a specific trace for each one of these many rootstocks that we have for apple trees. I'm not going to go through them because it's, it will be the most boring webinar that you ever sit through. But when you are looking over those rootstocks and their specific traits, you need to know what you want to grow, how you want to grow, and what are the limitations of your sites so you can narrow it down to the best possible rootstocks that you want to choose. I think that with that, that's everything that I had prepared for today. And I'm happy to answer if there are uh, questions. So I'm gonna stop Excellent. sharing the screen and I'm gonna go- Excellent, Amaya. Thank you so much. We do have a couple questions in the chat that I can share with you. And then I'll just encourage folks to continue to put questions in the chat as you, as you have them. So one of the questions, Amaya, was, um, is Ottawa 3 or 03 dwarf rootstock used in the USA? It's common in Canada, Canada and very winter hardy. Yes, those are actually available, though you can find them in a specific um um nurseries and you know they you have to go through their specific characteristics there's one of the things that i'm going to say is that we do have a lot of rootstock evaluations in in apple production uh, there's a multi-state uh, big project in which many universities are involved is called the nc 140 and the whole goal of that uh, program and this collaboration with researchers across the entire state is to evaluate the same rootstocks in different growing regions in the United States. And among those rootstocks that we have evaluated, the 
um, um, a lot of those that are not that might not necessarily be listed among the ones that I covered are also being tested and um, their information are available online if you go to their website if you just go on Google and see 140 you're going to see a lot of report and a lot of information on multiple rootstocks but yes that the, the Ottawa one is one that I did not include in the list of different ones but they are actually available and you can find a lot of information on it online Excellent. Thank you, Maya. Uh, we're going to launch a, a poll really quickly if folks could provide some feedback on that about today's webinar. And as folks are starting to think about that, Maya, I will I'll, I'll, I'll prep you with the next question. Um, and uh, we have someone who's interested in hearing more about uh, you commenting on planting on farmed ground for corn, soybeans, alfalfa, etc. Any risk of herbicide carryover or lay fallow for a while? Uh, yes. There's definitely some, uh, there could be some problems with um, herbicide uh, that is just, just left from, from, from these cropping systems. In general, one recommendation, this is, is beyond the selecting the rootstock because we don't have any rootstock that are resistant for all of this. But what you can do is you can use a cover crop to be able to uh, you know, reduce the amount of herbicide that is left uh, and also improve that soil. If you are establishing an orchard in sites that used to be soy, corn, bean, or there used to be alfalfa site, those, this is where it's really important to uh, do some soil analysis of the site, because this is going to tell you those crops, those row crops tend to be heavily fertilizer. So it might be that over time that soil has accumulated a lot of potassium, a lot of phosphorus, and that could have an effect on the way that your trees are going to develop. So if you know that you have sites that naturally have a lot of certain nutrients, like potassium is certainly one of them, you might want to, you, you, you could anticipate that you might have some uh, disorders, some um, post-harvest disorder on your fruit, and you might want to select a rootstock that might ameliorate that disorder. Okay, so again, I cannot address this enough. Making you know, taking that time, those three years in advance of researching the type of soil that you have, your texture, the amount of nutrients that they have, the history of those soils will really help you figure out what is the best rootstock for that site. Another question, Amaya, thank you for that answer. Would excess nutrients impact flower and fruit development as well? If you have a site that is very that has a lot of nutrients, especially nitrogen, that will result on trees when you plant them that they're going to be very vigorous. They will want to grow a lot of shoots, a lot of leaves. And every single time we have a tree that is very vigorous, that will be in detriment of producing first flowers. So that's why when we heavily fertilize those initial trees, we prune them heavily, those trees respond with a lot of vegetative growth and that delays the start of the fruit production. So yes, very heavy, very fertile soils will result on trees that are more vigorous. That's why if that's your case, you want to choose a rootstock that is more dwarfing, that is going to control that uh, so that you can start producing the first flowers and the first fruit earlier on. Excellent. And we've got one more question as we roll into the end of the hour. Uh, backyard apple trees, two to four trees, best source of trees and scions to use. Go to a nursery, go to uh, you know, a, a certified nursery that have good trees. It's the same is true for everybody. If you, if you, if you just want to buy a couple of trees from um, for your backyard, or you want to maybe you know graft your own, you can buy some rootstocks from a nursery and graft your own. Uh, that's one alternative, but I always say like there's plenty of nurseries, just make sure that you are buying from a reputable nursery that have uh, good quality trees that are disease free. Great. Thank you, Maya. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in the chat, but we've got a screen up to show you some of our additional upcoming webinars for this uh, beginner grower apple series. So hopefully you can take note of those and you can go ahead and get registered at our website. I just put the link in the chat as well as watch previous recordings, including today's presentation from Dr. Maya Tucha um, on selecting rootstocks. Okay, not seeing any more questions. I'll thank everyone again for their participation and thank our speaker, Dr. Atucha.
Great. Good feedback. That was very helpful. We're getting good feedback. That's wonderful. Thank you all. Um, hopefully people can go back and, and watch again the, the recordings. I know it's, it's a lot of information and it's hard to process all at one, but if you want to watch it a second time and get more of that information, you can do that.